Morning. Morning. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. yep. Okay. So um, this morning we're excited because a new little person is going to be meeting us probably sometime today. So that's exciting. And um, at the same time, we know there's lots of people going through a rough time right now, right? And uh, that's kind of how life is, right? Important thing is that we continue to do what we know as followers of Christ is the right thing to do. As a church family, to continue to love each other, support each other, pray for each other, and just faithfully proclaim the gospel. Right? And so mm -hmm. that's why we're here this morning. So I thank you for being faithful and uh, continuing to just do the work of the Lord. Uh, obviously, it's been a little more difficult for me lately, but you know, we're going to persevere and we're going to do the best we can. I appreciate your patience and your understanding and the fact that I can't exactly have a lot of charisma right now. Is that okay with everybody? Mm hmm. It's okay with Linda, so. <laughs> so we're good. Right, so. The subject that I wanted to start off at the beginning of the year here is this, uh, use this thing I'm calling the Matthew Pathway. Does everybody get a handout? The Matthew Pathway handout? Does anybody not have one? If you don't have one, raise your hand. Okay, Dawn needs one. Justin and John. Mm -hmm. And Noah. And Betty. Lots of people. Okay, keep your hand up if you need one. Okay, so I'll tell you the scripture reading this morning is going to be from Matthew chapter 27. And if you want to turn there, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 27. But before we get to that, and I'm going to have Elliot do the scripture reading for us this morning. Uh, in just a few minutes, but I want to explain a little bit before we actually get to the scripture reading. Okay. Um, yeah, lift my down. I'll put it back. Yeah, if you already have one, Bob, you can't take two. I'll put it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is nothing real complicated. I, what it is, I'm calling it a discipleship tool. One thing we talked about last week is the fact that in the Christian faith these days in America, seems so the church has lost its way in a lot of ways. But one of the ways that's been fairly obvious is the church is not doing really good, or Christians, I should say, are not doing really good at this idea of making disciples. <coughs> Churches are doing church, people are going to church, and that's all great. He says, God loves the church, we love the church, the church is fabulous. But the one thing that God gave to the disciples is this great commission uh, where he said, go and make disciples. So it seems as though we're not doing really good at that. So the purpose of me putting together this uh, handout is to simply be a discipleship tool. So this is for you to make disciples. It's not just a handout for sermons. The idea is, it's for you, that you yourself can use to disciple other people. Now I'm sharing it as sermons, because that's the format that we have in front of us, right? Uh, so kind of in a way, what's the difference is, what I'm doing here for the first part of the year is kind of more being an example, or giving you an example of how you can do the exact same thing. So this morning, you're not just listening to a sermon, and then you go home and you forget about it or whatever. Okay, I'm showing you how you yourself can do the same thing using this tool and this handout uh, to lead other people to faith in Christ. Okay, so that's the purpose of the Matthew pathway. Right, it's kind of, I went through the whole book of Matthew, each passage, and kind of created a little bit of a bullet point or a summary statement for each passage. Now, if you look on the very back page, there's instructions about how you can use this discipleship tool. Right, and again, you don't have to read that now, but just so you know, 
as you take it home and you look it over, start on the back page, because the back page gives you instructions about how you can use this tool to lead other people to faith in Christ. But what I did last week is, I kind of started at the end. So we actually started in Matthew chapter 28, the very last passage in the book of Matthew, and I went over that. Now, uh, okay, what I'd like you to do at this point is direct your attention to the front page of the handout. Okay, and uh, so this morning, as if I was going to be sharing this with a person who does not yet know Jesus, I would say to them, this is the Matthew pathway. It's a tool that we can use together and study together to learn how to follow Jesus. I'm already a follower of Jesus, and I love him and I've given my life to him. But if you're interested in also learning how to follow Jesus, we can go through the Matthew pathway together. And so then you would simply suggest to them that let's get together maybe once a week. Right? Is there anybody here who thinks that they can sacrifice maybe two or three hours a week for the sake of their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to try to disciple another person? Would you be willing to give a couple hours a week to Jesus? Anybody? Yep. yep. Okay. All right, so you just simply say to this other person, right, uh, I'm a follower of Christ, and if you'd like to learn what that means as well, let's get together and talk about it. In the meanwhile, I'll give you a copy of the Matthew Pathway. Start reading the book of Matthew, look at the summary points, and maybe try to take one passage a day, and when we get together, we'll talk about it. Okay? Nothing complicated. Pretty simple. And so last week was kind of like, because you're already the people of this church, you are already followers of Christ, I kind of started at the end to give you the big picture. Remember last week we talked about the main phrase that I highlighted last week in the last part of the book of Matthew was this phrase, with me always. Right, right at the very end of the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus gave that promise to his disciples. Right, he gave the great commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them, Teach them to obey everything I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. So last week we focused on the truth that the main thing of Christianity is the wonderful, amazing gift that God gives to us. That Jesus himself, the risen Son of God, actually goes through life with us. He lives in us by the power of his Holy Spirit and walks through life with us. It's an amazing, wonderful, fabulous gift of God. And we talked about that wonderful love. And we talked about it as a perfect love, as a great love. And I showed you many passages that describe the love of God and how that love is manifested in the fact that we have the amazing privilege to go through life with Jesus Christ living within us by His Holy Spirit. And as we grow as Christians, we come to appreciate that more and more all the time. The natural outflow of that is for us then to want to share that with those around us who do not yet know Jesus. And so if you look on the very front part of your outline there, right, uh, you'll see there's about six passages in Matthew uh, with little summary statements. And then you'll see in the middle of the page uh, four passages as well. And I'm calling those the big steps on the pathway of Christian faith mm -hmm. that we build our lives upon. Okay, so what I'm saying, the reason why I kind of superimposed those passages in there out of order is because I'm trying to give you an idea about what the main idea is, okay, about what it means to follow Christ. And then, uh, and what we're going to get to this morning is the first part of that, we're not going to get to that yet. But where we started last week was the last of the big steps, right? So if you look at where it says Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, it says, Our new purpose in life as a disciple of Jesus is to lead many more people 
to become disciples of Jesus, who obey everything Jesus has commanded, all of us enjoy a love relationship with him forever. And remember we had a prayer, right? It was up on the screen last week. And I'm just going to read it for you here, right? And to me, this is the goal. Each and every believer in Jesus Christ should be willing to uh, offer this prayer and basically live out this prayer. Okay, so here's the prayer, right? I'll read it for you. Lord Jesus, what a treasure it is to know that you are with me always through life. I am committed to obeying everything you have commanded as I go out to make more disciples, to live in your loving family all over the world. Lead me to my next disciple. Okay, so the last part of that prayer is, God, lead me to my next disciple. Okay, so that's what I was describing to begin with. And like I said, uh, so you lead that person, and if you look at the very top of your handout, if they start reading at the beginning of Matthew chapter 1, it simply introduces Christ, came from heaven and earth, to be God with us so we can have a, a relationship with God. That's what we talked about last week. So that's the main part that they need to understand. Matthew chapter 2, Jesus is the king worthy of our worship. And then uh, Matthew chapter 3 reinforces that idea of the love relationship. Uh, it says that just as Jesus heard words of love from his Father in heaven, we also can experience Father God's love as his precious sons and daughters. Right, and that's in Matthew chapter 3. When Jesus was getting baptized, he heard his Father speak these words from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The wonderful truth is that, that each and every one of us can hear those words from God in heaven. Either this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, or this is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Because of what Jesus has done for us, it's made it possible for us to have a love relationship. Okay, so that's what our focus this morning is going to be is what made it possible for Jesus to extend this love relationship to us. Right? Because we all celebrate the wonderful truth that we could experience a love relationship with God. But the thing we have to remember is what made it possible for us to experience a love relationship with God? Can anybody answer that question? What made it possible for God to forgive our sin, so that we can have a love relationship with God. The cross. The cross. Right? So I'm going to ask Elliot this time to come up. He's going to read Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 to 54. And I want you just to listen along. Okay? But I don't want you just to listen <laughs> as if this is just a history lesson. I don't want you to listen with the view of, well, yeah, I agree that that is true. I don't want you to listen to it as if it's just a fact to understand and to uh, agree with. What I want you to listen to is the heart of your Father God and the heart of His Son Jesus and what they were willing to do so that you could have a wonderful, perfect love relationship with God. Because this is the thing that people have to understand more than anything. If you're going to lead a person to faith in Christ, to become a disciple of Jesus, and a new follower of Jesus, it's all about the cross. They have to see the magnificent plan of God in the cross, and the amazing love that God showed to us by being willing to send His Son to be our Savior by dying on the cross of Calvary. And so to me, this is the critical point of decision, the critical understanding that we each need to come to, and we need to lead others to, to see the cross for all it is, and be willing to embrace that cross because of what Jesus did for us there. Okay? So let's listen to this passage, Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 to 54. Early in the morning, all the chiefs.
chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans uh, how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. <coughs> so they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it is called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel. And they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord has commanded me. Am I really allowed, Chris? Hmm. That's not really loud. Uh, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, uh, Do you hear the testimony they are bringing against him? But Jesus made no reply, not even a single charge, um, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus, or excuse me, it was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who calls himself the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with uh, Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. Then they all shouted louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. All hail the king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they mocked him, they took off his robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. <coughs> As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink and mixed with gall. But after testing it, he tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they had divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Uh, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and he will believe there and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said. Therefore he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him.
From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He is calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on the staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest, the rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud, loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs were broken open. The bodies of many people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Yeah, you can just hang out here for a few minutes. Um, so together, we just listen to this account of the crucifixion of Jesus. And you can sit with a person who does not yet know Jesus and sit together and read that account of the crucifixion of Jesus. But when you get to the end of it, what we have to all recognize is the fact that Jesus did that. The Father sent Jesus, and Jesus was willing to subject himself to that horrible crucifixion because of his great love for us. And the reason he had to do that is because of my sin. The reason he had to do that is because of your sin. The reason he had to do that is because of the sin of every man, woman, and child on the planet. And so that is the critical place where a person needs to understand. This is what the gospel is all about. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so I do lead people to those first couple of things on the, on the top of the page of the Matthew pathway. You'll notice you come to that passage that Jesus, or that Elliot just read about Jesus. Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 54. And it says, Because of our sinful human nature, God the Father sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, so that we could be forgiven and made holy, to enjoy a love relationship with God. So a person at, at the beginning of this needs to understand, first of all, like we talked about last week, God loves them. God desires to have a relationship with them. This week our focus is on what made that relationship possible, the death of Jesus on the cross. Because he loved us and he wanted to have that love relationship, Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, so that our sins can be forgiven and we can be reconciled to God. But that person is not yet a follower of Christ. There's something that they must do to enter into that relationship. God loves us. He's provided half of a love relationship. He loves us. But to show our love to Him, we also have to give something to Him. We have to make a commitment of faith. It begins with repentance. You'll notice in the, in the Matthew pathway outline, just before Matthew chapter 27, it shows Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Because those passages talk about what's necessary next, is our repentance. It says, just as our path to a relationship with God in the kingdom of heaven begins with a sincere conviction to repent, for our sins. That's what those passages talk about. Jesus himself invites us in those passages to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that, in a way, is an invitation. Okay, you want to enter into a relationship with Christ, it begins with repentance over your sins. The crucifixion that we just read about, that's why you're repenting. It's because your sins nailed the perfect Son of God to the cross. 
because of your sins, then God had to die so that your sins could be forgiven. That is something we need to repent for before God. What's one way we can manifest that repentance? And that's where you get into the first big step on the pathway. As you get to the middle of the page, the first big step is the big step. It's the difference between a person who does not yet follow Christ to becoming a follower of Christ. A person who is not yet a person of faith in Christ to becoming a person of faith in Christ. This is the big step. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 to 42 talks about this. And this is where it says this. Jesus also called each of us to the cross to lay down our own life, making a commitment of faith to him so that we can be saved, to overcome sin and death, and experience new life in Him. Coming to the end of ourselves is the beginning of Christian faith. Now in that passage, Matthew chapter 10, I'm just going to read verses 38 and 39. Right? And this is the point of decision for someone. Jesus says this, Anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Right? So people, if people want to become followers of Christ, what's it going to take? Pick up the cross and follow Jesus. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So that's a key phrase right there. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So just like Jesus had to bring himself to a place of total self-sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins, we need to, if we want to become followers of Christ, we have to bring ourselves to a place of total self-sacrifice in order to follow Christ. The problem is, most people don't want to do that. And one of the problems is that in today's society, there is a different type of Jesus that's portrayed that does not require you to make a life of total sacrifice. Okay, so I have asked Elias to give us, help us with a little illustration this morning. So if you want to get up there, son, grab that water pitcher right there. Okay, just hold that up. Yep, you're going to hold it. Okay. And uh, come over here on this side here. Okay, so. All right, so. This is an illustration, right? So the water pitcher represents a person's life. It's filled with all the stuff of life, their will, their emotions, their desires, uh, their uh, power to do what they want to do in life, right? That one just represents a, certain, a person's life. Now, according to these verses, God is asking us to completely sacrifice our lives, to give our life to him completely. But there is a false message that's portrayed today. And that is, instead of giving our lives completely to Jesus, we just add Jesus to our life. Okay, so now you need your grape juice. Yep, that would be good. Okay, so now Ellie is going to go. What they've done is they've added a little bit of Jesus. Isn't that what modern religion does? Just add a little bit of Jesus to your life. You know, Jesus exists to make you happy, to enhance your life. It's okay to still sin. All the water in that, in that picture is polluted by sin. Because it's the original life. Just need to add a little bit of Jesus. Jesus is just there to make you happy. Okay? That's a picture of religion. But does it qualify for this phrase in Matthew chapter 10? Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The person represented by this picture did not find their new life in Christ yet, because they've never lost their old life. I want to read a few other verses that go right along with this. Right? And this is another passage in Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, say something very similar. Right? And again, this water pitcher does not represent what these verses are saying. And this is Matthew 16, Verses 24 and 25. Okay. Yeah, hurry up. 
Matthew chapter 24, verses, no, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. What's this person trying to do? They want to save your life. Oh no, Jesus, I don't want to give you everything. I just want to add you a little bit into it. Jesus, just bless my life. You know, but I want to keep all my stuff. I want to do things my way. I want you to enhance my life. Hmm. Not replace it. Okay? But Jesus says it's different. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take this cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. You want to keep that life? Guess what? This person is going to perish in hell. Even if they try to add a little bit of Jesus in. That's what it says right there. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But, here's a critical phrase here. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. Okay, because this person has only found religion, adding a little bit of Jesus. What they need to do is lose their life, right? So now, I want to show you what it looks like for a person to become a follower of Christ for real, according to the Bible. A person who really becomes a person of faith, right? This person has to lose their life. Okay, so we have a thing up here. Uh, Elliot's going to not dump it on the front church pew. Uh, it's through the roaster up here, right? So don't. Okay. There you go. That person just willingly gave up their life to follow Christ. And what's going to happen now is because they emptied themselves of control of their own life, they made it possible for God to fill them with the fullness and perfection of his love. Right? So here's Jesus. Right? This is what Christianity is all about. Not adding a little bit of Jesus to our stuff. Christianity, they don't have to take the picture for no, no stuff. Yeah, we get the picture though. Right? There you go. Right? Christianity is about having God fill us to the full completely. Right? Now let me read those verses again, and let me ask you if these verses are fulfilled with this person who is willing to surrender their life to Christ fully, empty themselves at their own cross so that God can fill them with the Spirit of Jesus. Let me read those verses again. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. Did this person find his life? This person is what Christianity is all about. Finding your life in Christ. That's why it says in that section on the Matthew pathway, next to Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 42. That's what this phrase is talking about. Jesus also caused each and every one of us to the cross, to lay down our own life, making a commitment of faith to him, so that we can be saved, to overcome sin and death, and experience new life in him. Coming to the end of ourselves is the beginning of Christian faith. You see the difference? Somebody can see, yeah. 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 Okay. <clears throat> and so what I'm saying to us here this morning is, as you go out to share the Matthew pathway, this is the critical point of decision that you're trying to get people to come to. Right? Big step number one is where a person goes from being a heathen who doesn't know Jesus, becoming filled with Christ, 
because they empty themselves. They surrender themselves and make the commitment of faith to Jesus. And that's what we talked about last week with the prayer. Okay? So I just want to read that prayer one more time. And uh, next week, Cindy and uh, Michelle are going to share for Sanctity of Life Sunday. But then the following week, we're going to pick up and talk more about what this looks like to be a disciple maker. Uh, but I want you to invite God to speak to you about beginning the process of making disciples. It's all tied up in this prayer, right? Uh, let me read that prayer one more time and think about what it's saying. Lord Jesus, what a treasure to know that you are with me always through life. I am committed to obeying everything you have commanded as I go out to make more disciples to live in your loving family all over the world. Lead me to my next disciple. So my invitation to you this morning is Pray that prayer. Be willing to live out that prayer. And ask God, lead me to my next disciple. And as you pray that prayer, start listening. Okay, because you just ask God to lead you to the person he wants you to make a disciple of Jesus. And as God lays that person on your heart, then what you do is you forget all about it and you just go watch more television, right? <laughs> or you say, yes, Jesus, I am going to put my effort forth to speak to this person, to relate to this person in a loving way and invite them to become a follower of you. You are called to make disciples. So as you pray that prayer, ask God to lead you to the next person he wants you to make a disciple. And then go to that person and invite them to join you on the Matthew pathway. That's what this tool is for. Okay, sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I'm done. And anybody that wants some grape juice, we have some. <laughs> so I'll be back. Father in heaven, I thank you this morning for the word of God and for the wonderful truth of your great love. By the last week as we just uh, dug into the depths of your wonderful love for us, we're just amazed, Father, that you love us so much that you would be willing to create a way for us to have a relationship with you. And Father, we saw this morning with the scripture passage that Elliot read what it took for you to be able to offer to us a love relationship. Because we were dead in our sins. We were corrupted in our sins. And that sin separated us from you. But the only way that you could offer to us to be in a love relationship with you is if you had a way to forgive our sins. And you did have a way, Father. You sent your son Jesus to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. To die that cruel death for us in our place. And because of that precious sacrifice, now our sins can be forgiven. And because our sins can be forgiven, now we can enter into a relationship with you. A relationship filled with the perfect love of God. What an amazing gift. But Father, there's something that you require of us, and that is repentance. And so Father, each and every one of us have come to this place. And if for any reason, that even right now, at this moment, there's even one person here who has never come to that place. I invite you to come to that place right now, a place of repentance. 
and simply lay yourself before God and say, God, I'm sorry. I repent because my sin nailed your son to the cross. I'm sorry, Father, please forgive me. And now I want to give my life to Christ in faith. I'm willing to lay my life down at the cross so that I might follow him. Father, I pray that if there's even one here today that has never prayed that prayer, that they did it right now in their heart. And Father, for the rest of us that have already made that commitment, I pray that now, Father, because we appreciate the wonderful love of Jesus, that now he goes with us as we go out to make more disciples. Father, how can we say we appreciate the love of God and the forgiveness of sins if we're not willing to share it with the next person? Father, we are surrounded by people who are still lost and broken and separated from you. So we pray this prayer like we learn. Lead me to my next disciple. Even now, Father, speak into hearts as we just close this time of studying your word together. Speak to our hearts, Father. Who is the person that you want us to reach? Who is my next disciple? And Father, as we lay that person on our heart, I pray that you give us courage to invite them to join us and follow Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful plan that you've given to us through the scripture to join you in your plan to save the world. Thank you, Father. I pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and turn to him.